regularly scheduled meeting of the Homelessness and Poverty Committee for today, Thursday, August 12th. Um, and uh, we are prepared to proceed with the matters that are uh, before us. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please establish a quorum? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Council Member Ridley Thomas? Here. Council Member De Leon? Here. Here. Council Member Raman? Here. Thank you. And as mentioned, Council Mem Councilwoman Rodriguez is absent. And Council Member Buscaino? Good morning here. Good morning, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have four members and a quorum. Oh, thank you very much, and welcome to all of the members. Um, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, we acknowledge the absence of our colleague, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, uh, in terms of uh, her having <clears throat> a funeral today that um, made it very difficult, near impossible to be here, a uh, close family member. So we send her our condolences. On today's agenda, we have um, the city's uh, first ever street engagement strategy. Uh, and uh, the strategy, members of the committee and those who are listening, uh, simply aims to set in place a process that ensures that our unhoused neighbors and residents are connected to interim housing and permanent housing with supportive services attached. And we wish to see that happen sequentially um, so that they are afforded every benefit of uh, the good work that uh, the city can do. So today we will review the CAO report, which proposes a process to operationalize this work and incorporate the refinements so that the citywide street engagement strategy can advance uh, promptly to the full council. Now we have several guests, <clears throat> subject matter experts uh, today who will help us uh, work our way through this conversation, members of the committee. Uh, first will be Yolanda Chavez from the, C, uh, the city CAO office. Uh, She'll present an overview of the uh, street engagement uh, strategy as that office was assigned lead role in doing so uh, by the council. Uh, joining her will be Dr. Valicia Adams Kellum of uh, St. Joseph's Center, uh, who has been doing uh, a heavy lift over the past uh, several weeks that has been the focus of attention uh, in terms of the work on Venice Beach, but well before that, Dr. Um, Adams Kellum has uh, uh, been doing uh, uh, this work at St. Joseph's and other venues for a considerable length of time. And finally, Libby Boyce uh, from the county's Housing for Health Division. She's here to share her insights and underscore uh, the need for uh, collaboration. One issue on the agenda today so that we can focus and dive in um, and uh, uh, move this matter uh, forward. Uh, with that uh, set of introductory remarks, uh, uh, let's now transition to uh, public comment. Um, and we have a representative from the city attorney's office who will provide the appropriate guidance as to how we should proceed. Uh, Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everyone. To the members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please clearly state your name, and if you would like to speak on the single agenda item for which you, have, you will have one minute to speak on. Additionally, if you would like to address the committee with a general public comment, then you will be provided one additional minute to speak for a maximum up to two minutes per person for the agenda item and general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. 
If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on the agenda item, you will get a brief warning from the chair or myself. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker. We will take up to 40 minutes total of public comments today. Please press star nine to request to speak. As soon as you hear someone address you on the phone, please press star six and state your name and state if you are speaking on the agenda item and or providing general public comment. Thank you for your cooperation. And thank you. We'll now turn to the city clerk, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-431-9380, and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. When it is your turn to speak, an automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star six to unmute. Um, let me repeat that. When it is your turn to speak, an automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star six to unmute. Please note, if you are listening to the meeting on a computer or a speakerphone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices before you speak. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Again, once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We thank you. <clears throat> let's proceed now. Uh, Ms. Tilton, let's go to the first speaker. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Let's proceed to the next speaker. Caller, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, my name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. I would like to speak on item one. After that, general public comment, please. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Thank you. I would like to speak on item one. I know you guys have already taken action on this, but I like that the words you've used are street engagement strategy because every strategy can be changed, right? For the better of the people. Now, I don't like the language in your motion because you guys talk about people experiencing homelessness in a way that I think is a little bit strange, P-E-H. For me, I was confused what you guys were talking about until I went back to the beginning and I realized that there was that word, P-E-H. The people experiencing homelessness are our neighbors. They're, they're not homeless people. They are just simply people. So, I think we should change that language to just citizens, right? Because anybody could be homeless. You guys could be homeless. I could be homeless. Now to my public comment, please. I want to talk about the motion for the vaccine ordinance that Nuri passed, that Nuri um, motions to be developed. The language in that motion is discriminatory, and I believe it pushes a eugenics era stigma about people with medical conditions. It's in direct violation of the Department of Fair Employment and Housing UNRU Civil Rights Act, especially when calling unvaccinated people dangerous to children. This Civil Rights Act is meant to cover all arbitrary and intentional discrimination by business establishments. It outlaws discrimination on medical condition and genetic information and other personal characteristics. This ordinance motion violates our Constitution protected rights to equal protection under law. Our California Patient Bill of Rights to refuse treatment and refuse medical experimentation. Businesses included in the UNRU Act are public agencies, theaters, hotels, restaurants. Motion, the motion for this ordinance violates our public freedom in a way that cannot be tolerated. Please strike down this item and never consider doing this to us again. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hi, yes, my name is Caleb Crowder. I'd like to speak on item number one in general public comment, please. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. 
Thank you. <clears throat> what is striking about this motion and legislation to me is that it prioritizes criminalization, displacement, and frankly, racist segregation as practice. Even if there were an actual robust inventory of permanent and non-congregate housing available, which there's not, this legislation would remain to be segregationist. COVID cases are rising among members of the unhoused community right now, and it is directly linked to forcing individuals into congregate living situations. There's no denying that. Outbreaks are happening among staff, too. If this committee and our larger body were serious about finding dignified solutions for our unhoused community, then there would be language and intention to actually find permanent, non-congregate solutions now. You'd have been willing to commandeer all hotels that were necessary. You'd have been willing to go after speculative developers who continually run massive vacancies, and you'd have fought for rent and mortgage forgiveness, extended the moratorium, etc. Meanwhile, we are demobilizing Project Room Key, which will create a massive inflow, and you all know this, of unhoused folks to the shelter system, which increases the likelihood likelihood of more outbreaks of COVID. It will scare some back onto the streets and it will play right into the punishing hands of enforcement, displacement, segregation, criminalization, jail time, and psychological as well as physical harm. Unfortunately, we don't have another option on the table today. We beg of you to listen to experts, to impacted people, to service providers, to all of us, but we'd rather beat the drums of white supremacist segregation rather than stand up for some of our most victimized. The resources are there and they are not finite. They are made finite by our way of selecting resources. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Well, we thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Zachary Warma, Legislative Affairs Manager with the Downtown Women's Center, calling today on item one. The adoption and implementation of a citywide streets engagement strategy is critical if we hope to build a truly responsive, trauma-informed, and human-centric system of homeless service provision. To minimize the risk of further traumatization, criminalization, or displacement, it is incumbent that we lead with services that address the pressing needs of our unsheltered neighbors and provide actual pathways to permanent housing. A successful streets engagement strategy also requires coordination with county partners in LASA to ensure a clear set of objectives and to provide a consistent support to our unhoused residents, which the motion on regional governance this committee approved in June powerfully identifies. Lastly, as you contemplate the allocation of new state and federal dollars, we urge that these resources be utilized in a way to provide the permanent housing necessary to actually break the cycle of houselessness for unsheltered Angelinos. Your recent motion, Mr. Chair, to create 10,000 new ongoing flexible housing subsidies through the Housing Now program is a powerful potential step in that direction. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, noted. We thank you for your testimony. We'll take the next caller, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Caller, please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, hi, um, I'm a real unsheltered Angelino turtle, so please give me at least two minutes to talk about general public comment and agenda item one. Um, I live in the LA River and I don't have electricity, so it's really hard for me to get my voice heard around here and it's getting much harder. Um, I would appreciate it if you would stop trying to ban things that you don't want, like plastic straws and, and plastic bags and homeless people and sporks. As we know from the plastic ban, banning things does nothing to make them go away. As for as general public comment, I would like to know if I'm still included in general public comment or if I'm not allowed anymore. You have a minute remaining to speak. Proceed, please. Thank you. So could you please stop having guests to talk to this committee that are not homeless people. Every single meeting, you should have an unsheltered person talking, and that should be required. In my neighborhood, there's people that are in a hate group, and they call in, and they, they block the public comment so that we can't be heard. And it's already hard enough to be heard and get, get our voices heard here. So thank you. And we take note of that. We thank you for your call. We will take the next caller, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. 
Yes, hello, my name is Jane Demion, and I'd like to speak on item number one and general public comment. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Thank you. I am the co-chair of SELA Neighborhood Homeless Coalition Eagle Rock and Highland Park Chapter. We do weekly outreach and engagement with our unhoused neighbors. The Street Engagement Strategy Report is a good start in terms of proposing real solutions to our homelessness crisis. In contrast, the LAMC 4118 ordinance is not a real solution. It is a dangerous band-aid that will create more obstacles and barriers to housing. The interaction of the 4118 ordinance and the proposed street engagement strategy is not clear because of multiple inconsistencies. The impl implementation of a street engagement strategy for concentrated engagement requires that a council motion or resolution is necessary to begin the process of extensive outreach, but only to large encampments. What about the smaller encampments and rough sleepers? Sounds like the new strategy is only to be used for certain unhoused people and not others. Why? That doesn't make sense. The Street Engagement Strategy Report states that ample time should be allowed for comprehensive engagement. LEMC 4118 gives unhoused individuals 14 days to move with no maps of safe zones. 14 days is no time at all. So smaller encampments are subject to the untenable 14-day signage and forced to move. If unhoused individuals are forced to move from place to place, service providers will no longer be able to locate those individuals and they will lose an opportunity for housing. LAZA and service providers have access to an enormous infrastructure to provide the necessary paperwork and layers of documentation to get unhoused folks pointed towards housing resources. An offer of housing, quote unquote, is not actual housing. If there is no housing, if there are no project room key rooms, no project home key rooms, and now with the Delta variant raging, more congregate shelters cannot house high-risk individuals, we will continue to see scarcity of housing possibilities. Certainly, permanent housing is extremely scarce or not available at this point. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, duly noted, if there is a written statement you would like to submit, we'll be more than happy to uh, review it. Hopefully some of what you've raised will be addressed um, when we get to the discussion with the members of the committee, as well as the uh, conversation with our subject matter experts. All right, we have uh, two to three more people on the line, uh, members of the committee, uh, and we will go to the next caller. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Yes, uh, this is Rishi Serjanko from the People's City Council. I'd like to speak on item number one and general public comment, please. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Yes, uh, the, the street engagement strategy uh, being debated today, um, you know, is in service of displacement and criminalization, not addressing the needs of unhoused people or the broader community. I want to uplift what, uh, what a few caller, one of the callers uh, uh, said, um, the, one of the unhoused people that called in and said that they feel like that their voices are being uh, silenced, um, especially by the NIMBYs that call in um, and I, I think it's true. And I think they made a really good point about how there should be um, one on house, per, at least one on house person uh, attending these meetings uh, um, uh, so you can hear directly from them. And MRT, you just said something about subject matter experts. Um, how many on house people do you have um, are, are you consulting with when on the street strategy? Wouldn't they be the quote unquote? subject matter experts so how many are you consulting with um are you talking with them about how you want to criminalize homelessness in, in los angeles um you know i've called in previously and had and had uh nice things to say about you mr ridley thomas um but I'm sure you've seen that, that many people are not uh, happy with your proposal. And so I have to ask, what is really going on? What happened? Um, you came in uh, with a lot of promises. Um, <clears throat> and 
I think it's pretty offensive to groups like K-Town for All that you would um, engage with them in such a way and, and then turn your back on them and propose this strategy after meeting with billionaire Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, the timeline is just too funny, MRT, that you meet with Katzenberg and he meets with all the city council members and, and, and then suddenly you propose the the uh, 18 anti camping motion. Hold on for a moment. Um, your time um, has expired. Um, we appreciate your observations. Um, in some respects, factually incorrect. And perhaps if you hang in uh, for the balance of the committee, we'll have an opportunity to clarify those things that you have uh, raised questions about. All right. Thanks for your call, per usual. Next speaker, please. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Good morning, council committee members. Mr. Mark Lee really Thomas. Um, my name is Lionel Mares from CD6, calling about um, item one and general public comment, please. You have one minute for the item and one minute for general public comment. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, regarding about the motion um, to engagement with the unhoused community across the city of LA. I believe that the city of LA, LASA, and other organizations such as Everyone In, United Way of LA, should work together and forming strategies on, on better engagement with unhoused communities. Um, many of these groups, formal organizations like Everyone In, um, have already established, um, I guess, relationships, and maybe it's best if the city will allow them to engage with the unhoused communities and and then let LASA do the work of transitioning them to supportive housing long term. Hopefully that is a goal long term. But transitional housing is okay as long as they provide a path towards long term housing. That is how I view things in my in my, in my, in my thought process. So I hope that we could work with other organizations on, you know, on, on forming long-term solutions rather than short-term solutions. Moving on to general public comments, please, Mr. Mark Willie Thomas. Yes, sir. Proceed. Um, and I just want to say um, we've been working on this for years, many years. I read many peer review articles on this issue from professors, researchers, and I believe that um, that the city of LA. And the committee members should reach out to professors and researchers who have spent countless hours working on this issue because they're the experts, so, quote unquote, the experts on this field and not attorneys or, or bureaucrats or, or long term civil servants who have no experience working with the unhoused population. I believe that we should work with people with the master's or doctor's degree who have been working on this issue because they're the ones who will focus on this. That is my opinion. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mark Willie Thomas. Thank, Thank you, you, sir, for expressing your opinion. Uh, you're welcome to call at any point in time. Uh, your comments are noted. Uh, we'll, not, we'll go to the next speaker, and Madam Clerk, if you deem it appropriate to indicate um, that um, uh, persons are welcome to call in. I think we have uh, one or two more people, and then we're going to go to the balance of the agenda if no one else uh, calls in. Let's proceed. Please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. Please press star six to unmute and please state your name and the items you wish to speak on. That caller dropped off and that is the remainder of the callers for today. All right, Madam Clerk, for the record, would you just indicate um, the opportunity for people to call in the number on which they can call in if they're are so inclined, otherwise we're gonna proceed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so for members of the public who would like to offer public comment um, on today's agenda, you should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-431-9380 and then press pound 
press pound again when prompted for participant ID once admitted into the meeting. Mr. Chair, those are the remarks. All right, thank you very much. That's for the record. Uh, now, Madam uh, Clerk, um, let's move on to item number one. If you would be kind enough to uh, read um, the item for the record. Yes, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Item number one is a city administrative officer report dated July 28, 2021, relative to the street engagement strategy. And this is in response to motion Gregorian et al. Price, which was approved on June 29, 2021. This matter is also referred to the Energy, Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and River Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, members of the committee on July the 28th, City Council received the first installment of um, what will undoubtedly be a robust uh, citywide engagement strategy. Under the score, it's the first of the kind in our city. I repeat that the objective of the strategy is, the strategy is to ensure a standardized assessment of encampments, of encampments rather than an adequate period of dedicated street engagement sites where unsheltered people reside in a transparent and I would like, like to say a, an accountable process by which nonprofit street engagement teams work collaboratively with the city and county, um, all those departments to help unsheltered individuals transition indoors to more appropriate and dignified interim and permanent housing options with the appropriate services attached. Members of the committee, the goal is to approve the item today and move it forward as amended with the goal of having full council action on the street engagement strategy before September 3, which is the date uh, that the city's ordinance uh, that regulates uh, space is specified uh, the areas that will be affected. Um, I think it's important that each of us look at our respective districts as we uh, have this conversation and speak to the multidisciplinary teams that are already doing important work. Uh, this should be an enhancement. CD10, uh, we can speak about the work that's been done in the Mert Park uh, by Hoppix. Since the work has done, been done at Venice and David in West Los Angeles by the people uh, concern. The work that's being done as we speak in um, Koreatown um, by the people concerned and a host of collaborating entities. I know that Mr. De Leon, Vice Chair, Ms. Raman, Mr. Buscaino, and we acknowledge the presence of Mr. Bonin, who's going to participate in our conversation today, all can cite various organizations with which they have worked and continue to work to get this done. This should be seen as an elevation and a more coherent way of getting to the stated goals and objectives. I can say the work um, is important. We know that and what it requires is additional funding and dedicated personnel, uh, a degree of flexibility and uniformity so that we can deal with storage, with motel vouchers, with transportation, and help connect the clients to permanent housing with our property owners who have been smart enough to accept uh, government funded rental subsidies. All of that is in play going on now. We need to do it more, we need to do better, we need to be more coherent. Um, I made reference to the work that's been done most recently by Mr. Bonin, our colleague, and um, Dr. Adams Callum, um, who will offer their uh, perspective um, on the subject. Um, we take note that the activity in Echo Park uh, took place um, under Council Member O'Farrell's uh, watch formerly chaired homelessness and uh, poverty. He was unable to join us, but uh, sent some comments 
for us to uh, uh, consider, and I'd like uh, to do that. Um, and so uh, let's begin uh, with um, a, a few remarks from uh, Mr. Bonin. Uh, as has been um, indicated, we will then proceed with a uh, presentation from uh, Mr. Chavez uh, and members of the committee at any point that you want to weigh in. Uh, glad to do that. Uh, hear your questions and so forth. We'll work our way through it. We'll keep maintain our regular schedule. Um, uh, we'll be done by noon, uh, but by that time, uh, if not before, we will have had a substantial conversation and uh, move this along the process as is our intent. Saban, just a few remarks, if you would. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for inviting me to, to come here today. And thanks even more importantly for inviting uh, Felicia adams Kellum from St. Joseph Center to be here. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the woman of the hour from the organization of the hour. Um, you, you'd asked me to, to talk a bit about the, the project that had been done in Venice over the past month, and, and, and I'm happy to do so. Uh, I do want to um, uh, uh, point out that... Um, uh, the the effort in Venice um, uh, wasn't new. Uh, you know, we built on the work that you did, Mr. Ridley Thomas, and the work that, that Ms. Raman has done, similar approach, and tried to build on that and, and use the lessons from it. I think what's different about Venice is that uh, anything that happens in Venice comes with uh, an international spotlight. Uh, sometimes the uh, interference from... Um, uh, 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 certain uh, countywide uh, officials uh, who like to come in and, and, and uh, siphon off some of that uh, attention. Uh, but it, I think what was also different in, in Venice is just the size and the scope of it, because St. Joseph Center was able to, to move indoors 211 people. But the, but the other two things that I think were, were, were different and distinct about the program is um, that First of all, it, I think, helped, uh, 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 as the LA Times wrote, uh, rebut a, a pretty prevalent myth that, that, that of, of people who are service resistant and do not want housing. If there was a, a population deemed difficult to house and help in Los Angeles, Venice Beach is, is one of those places where that, was, 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 uh, that narrative was written most indelibly. And uh, what we found uh, is that most everybody uh, wanted to get off the streets if what we were offering was actually housing, not a temporary shelter, not a temporary intervention, not a, not, not a tiny home. They wanted actual housing, and that, I think, is, is, is the real key. What was somewhat different about this program is that, uh, uh, oddly, we started with the end, and the piece the city needed to put in was the middle. Uh, St. Joseph Center came to me uh, you know, back in March and said, you know, we have the, the, the long-term housing resources through vouchers, and Ms. Ms. Adams can talk about them, where we can actually get a couple hundred people uh, housed for good. Uh, what we need is something to do in the interim. And that's where the city came in, and the city offered the resource for the interim. What we have tended to do traditionally is have the interim and, and hope and pray that the long term will come. And that, that's a model that I think a lot of people are, are, are skeptical of who are unhoused because they feel like they're just going to be bumped back out on the street. So uh, I have been very unwilling to fly onto an aircraft carrier and proclaim mission accomplished on this because for me, we aren't done with encampment to home in Venice. We, we finished phase one, which was bringing people indoors to the interim, to safety and to services. But the measure of success of this program or any other is do people actually wind up in long-term housing and off the streets? Really glad to see Libby Boyce on this call because I'm a huge fan of, of Housing for Health, which sort of takes that model and has been, I think, the unheralded success story in, in, in Los Angeles County and, and, and the model we should follow. So what I'd say is what was really important here, what we did in Venice, was that it's real housing. And uh, I'd, I'd be very cautious of anything that, that says it's encampment to home if it's not a home. Uh, encampment to 
bridge housing is not a home. Encampment to tiny homes is for most people not a home unless they know that there is actual long-term housing on the end. I think the other thing that we, we found valuable was to be able to give people a range of options and understand that people are different and have different needs uh, and different desires. Uh, and um, so not everybody uh, wanted the same thing and not everybody accepted the same thing. That required of, of us in St. Joseph Center and the various members of the team, both flexibility and patience. So when St. Joseph Center was doing a certain area of the boardwalk, they said, you know what? We, we don't want to stick by the, the, the same arbitrary timeline. We want more time to work with people and to help them transition off the streets. It so happened that many of those people in that area were artists uh, and they were vendors down on the beach. So what we had to do is find out how we can accommodate their inventory of art. So we found a place for storage. We found a place for them to be close by and to be able to continue doing their business. And I'm hoping that we can help support them with some micro enterprise uh, uh, resources. The other thing I think was really very important uh, was to come into this with uh, no judgment uh, and, to, and to respect uh, the, the, the dignity and the agency of every person who was living out on the streets and, and to give them the ability to direct what it is they want and they need. We can't, whether it's with this program or, or, or any other, I, I, I feel very strongly, we cannot go to them and say, um, we have a shelter bed, take it or leave it. I think we have to go to them and we have to ask, what is it you need? What is it that will help you? And, and allow them to help define what it is we need to offer. And I think uh, that is particularly key. And it speaks to the, the call for more uh, lived experience from people who have, have been on the streets or are on the streets. I'm, I'm glad to hear from our CLA's office offline that they are wrapping up uh, their report on uh, my motion for a commission on lived experience, which would be uh, very vital to, to have in situations like this. Um, so those are the, 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 the lessons that, 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 that we took uh, from Venice Beach, uh, lessons that are continuing, because as I said, this isn't excess until everybody is, is housed long term. The, the one thing I'd say about the proposal before you today, and, and I'm not sure if I'm misreading it or if it just hasn't been spelled out, but um, I, I, I hope, I beg, I implore that whatever resources are made available as a result of this engagement strategy in terms of outreach and in terms of housing are, are, are not limited only to areas where someone may be choosing to enforce 4118. Uh, that I hope that the resources are available to each council member as they see foot, fit to, to implement in their district to try to help people uh, most in need. Because if we went from a system where we all have access inadequate to some resources to one where we have more resources, but they're contingent upon uh, in, in, an enforcement strategy, then that would uh, really be the tail wagging the dog and it would really be uh, a, a, a very unfortunate holding hostage of, of, of housing to, to that strategy. And I think uh, we should have the ability to uh, do it more broadly uh, where needed with whatever strategy uh, is appropriate. And I'd like to keep emulating the strategy that we did. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank, thank you, Alicia. Alicia. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Bonner, for your insights and the like. Uh, um, the idea is to have a conversation that critiques what you experience um, and uh, effectively to see how we can uh, make it uh, applicable in ways that are appropriate citywide. I did ask uh, Councilman O'Farrell uh, to share his thoughts. Uh, Echo Park he indicates uh, a way of comment um, to me, um, uh, took advantage of Urban Alchemy, an entity that he supported through discretionary funds uh, uh, since last December. They performed uh, uh, admirably in terms of those who were encamped at uh, Echo, Echo Park Lake. Mr. O'Farrell makes the point that over 100 of the individuals who accepted the housing showed up there in 
um, the last few weeks uh, leading up to the closure in late March. They knew about it through word of mouth that they were going to place everyone in a safe uh, environment, no matter how or when they got there. And so Mr. O'Farrell makes the point that uh, through the resources at his disposal, he moved the uh, agenda forward. Uh, his was a concern about uh, the issue of uh, crime uh, that took place. Uh, and since uh, uh, the interventions there of closing the lake, uh, violent crime uh, uh, has declined by 88% uh, uh, and um, virtually all of the victims uh, who were uh, formerly homeless, uh, issue of a range of assaults and battery, uh, all too often commonplace, according to his representations. And, uh, there were four overdose uh, deaths and over a six month period, all documented. Um, but since that time, uh, he asserts that the lake has been uh, open and safe secure uh, now uh, and since before Memorial Day. Um, so Farrell makes the point that homelessness in Echo Park has declined sharply. And as we've stood up uh, an additional 200 housing solutions, including a tiny home village and a safe sleep site, both managed by Urban Alchemy, the nonprofit uh, that would be the counterpart or, uh, to uh, St. Joseph's in the Venice Beach space. Uh, and uh, more of the same is in the making. Um, so uh, here we have two examples, uh, very different. Uh, and I want to transition uh, to uh, the CAO and with a question being um, your presentation uh, uh, will come before us, but as we move through it, uh, some of what I think we need to know is how in uh, Echo Park, how in Venice Beach, how in other instances might the objectives that we seek be applied and or enhanced? Um, because that's ultimately what this is about. We begin with uh, Ms. Chavez from the CAO's office to make her presentation. Members of the committee, after she makes her presentation, if you wish to weigh in, feel free to do so. And we'll proceed from there to Dr. Adams Cullum and then to Libby Boyce. But let's move through uh, this accordingly. Yolanda Chavez, the floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, Yolanda Chavez with the CEO's office. I'm going to um, share my screen. So let's see if this works. Here we go. Sorry. There we go. Okay. So, um, so good morning again. Um, and as you know, we were directed to develop a street engagement strategy that was really a targeted outreach approach, which provides people experiencing homelessness with a suitable offer of shelter, um, whether it's interim or permanent housing to avoid enforcement. I also want to note that this report also responds to Council File 20-1406 as it relates to documenting written protocols for transitioning people experiencing homelessness to shelter as a result of the Paxton Bradley effort that was conducted in CD7. Um, I want to stress that we really use the best practices that are currently implemented by the city and county outreach teams and the council offices as you conduct your engagement efforts, which really at the core are about assessing people's needs 
and connecting them to services and housing. So I uh, want to really stress that what we outlined in the procedures, in the reports, in attachment one and two of, of the report is, is nothing new. It's, it's really we're documenting the process that is used to house people or to bring them from street to home or encampment to home and, um, and really highlight what works um, based on, again, experiences of city and county outreach teams and council offices. Um, I think the difference here is that we're recommending, so one, we're documenting the process and improving it as we have these discussions, of course, but we're also, I think the difference here is that we're recommending that the street to home procedures be used for the implementation of the recently amended Los Angeles Municipal Code section 4118 C1 through 4 and D if the proposed designated site is encamped. So I want to note that it's not that it's these resources only go to that enforcement or that um, implementation of 4118, but it's it's we're recommending this is what is done every day to try to get people into housing. And if we are going to implement 4118 and and post um, inability of people to lie or sleep in certain areas as outlined in the ordinance. This is this engage. This is a type of engagement that we're recommending. So the core components of this engagement are strong coordination between the service planning area leads, LASA council office, county outreach teams, etc. You know, city departments, county departments, everyone that needs to be involved. Um, there always needs to be a lead of, for an engagement. And so one of the things that we're recommending later on is that the service planning area lead together with LASA and the county and the council office determine who the lead for that engagement is, depending on the site and the encampment. Um, the other core, of course, is to provide ample time for engagement. And what we're recommending is up to four months. It does not mean every engagement lasts four months, but it's really up to that engagement team once they assess the encampment and assess the needs of the people in that encampment to determine how long will that engagement take to be able to, to house everyone and provide a housing option for the individuals there. Uh, but this is one of the ample time is really what everyone who's involved in this type of work stresses, right? Two, two weeks is not enough time to build a relationship and to, and to really assess needs and to bring in the additional services that are needed. Uh, the core, and I would say the key for this is the availability of housing resources. I mean, I think we, we all understand that if we don't have the housing resources and we don't have a place for people to go, uh, so a suitable housing option for people in encampments, we cannot clear encampments. So we would use any available housing resource that provides that. And I think as Mr. Bonin says, one of the um, one of the resources that's become available through the American Rescue Plan is the emergency tenant-based vouchers. And that has really provided us another um, another option for permanent housing, which we didn't have six months ago. You know, we just don't have enough vouchers overall, but these emergency tenant-based vouchers have provided an additional uh, resource. Um, the other key component is transparency and adequate notice, whether we're cleaning a site or whether the site is going to be uh, cleared for, or uh, for, you know, for, um, for overnight sleeping or um, anything we're going to do, we really need to provide clear notice and and at least 14 days notice once there's postings to for an effective day to try to enforce if enforcement is going to take place. And consistency, right? We need to be consistent throughout the city and be very clear as to if if 
the regulations or process changes that we communicate that clearly to the outreach team, service providers, um, council offices, and other key partners. Um, so before, I have a few proposed amendments to the strategy procedures, but again, want to note that the procedures and the strategy are really based on what outreach teams currently do. There are a few changes that um, we, we wanted to propose to really ensure that the council offices are engaged in this um, in these efforts as they currently are. And I don't think the, the current uh, version of the report makes that clear. So we wanted to insert in coordination with council office in the areas where we're determining the lead for the street to home engagement or encampment to home and insert council office in the responsible party in under attachment one steps one through seven as they are part uh, as they are an integral part of that engagement team. Uh, we wanted to replace concentrated engagement with street engagement because that's really what is used or if you prefer encampment to home, either one. Um, we wanted to delete the requirement that a motion be introduced for both a street to home or street to home engagements and the implementation of section 4118 C through D um, and replace it instead with a resolution but only or the introduction of a resolution, but only for the implementation of 4118. We felt we shouldn't require council offices to introduce a motion for street to home engagements they're already doing and they're engaged with every day, that that shouldn't be required. But if, um, if a council member chooses to implement 4118 in an encamped area, then we would recommend that the introduction that the resolution be introduced to start the street engagement process. The resolution should um, include findings that relate to the proposed designation as outlined in the ordinance. So whether this is an issue of the school or daycare center or an area where there there's crime, whatever those findings are based on the ordinance that should be included in the resolution. And again, if the proposed site is in camp, that the resolution be approved pending the completion of a street to home engagement. Um, and here I have a, a couple of changes and I apologize because I had, I got a last minute change from the city attorney, which I appreciate, but I wanted to spend a little time on this slide um, just to stress that um, we, we understand from council based on the motion that we really want to limit the interaction between law enforcement and people experiencing homelessness. And we will be coming back uh, to report on models and options for, for voluntary compliance, whether it's a different team that comes forward with lived experience to ensure that we don't have to involve LAPD or, or limit their involvement as much as possible. Um, but we did want to note that if there's a need for enforcement, we do have to collect some information to protect the city from liability, whether it is a result of criminal prosecution or a civil lawsuit. So, um, and I apologize again, because um, I'm gonna read the revised language um, I received from the city attorney a few minutes ago. But I think the key here is that after um, there, the area has been, the signage has been posted in a designated area, there are, you know, there has to be an effective date on that, on that signage as to when it becomes effective. So, and it has to provide for at least a 14 day period in terms of notice from the time the sign is posted to the time it becomes effective. So during those 14 days, we will continue to encourage the outreach teams to conduct outreach for anyone remaining on the site. After the 14 day, if there's a need for enforcement, um, this is the language and please ignore the, the language on the PowerPoint, but this is the language that we are proposing. If enforcement of 4118 is required to remove a person from the site, 
LASA will provide an offer of suitable housing slash shelter immediately prior to any enforcement activity taking place and shall document that offer. This documentation must include the person's name, the housing option offered, the date and location the offer was made, and the name and contact information of the person making the offer. LASA will maintain this documentation and provide it to the city attorney uh, for enforcement uh, um, for enforcement or legal proceedings as needed. And I'm sorry, provided to the city attorney as needed for enforcement or legal proceedings. So again, only if there is a need for enforcement. And of course, the goal is to limit that, but we do want to note that we need the city would want to collect this information to um, for um, liability purposes um, or to protect us from liability. Um, the other thing we wanted to uh, propose is some amendments to the report recommendations. Um, and so uh, for recommendation one, we'd like to replace the recommendation to report with this recommendation, which really provides us with a date for which we would come back and report. So the, we want to use the straight engagement for 4118 as a pilot through December 31st, 2022. Um, for recommendation number three, which we request that the LASA uh, outreach teams or homeless engagement teams that they use set their 17 city funded homeless engagement teams for this effort. We added in partnership with the council offices, this, the service program area or SPA leads and the County of Los Angeles multidisciplinary team. So that was the addition to that, um, to, this, to this recommendation for uh, recommendation four, the only change there is that the report actually says 17 engagement teams. It should be 13 that were only funded through September. So this uh, recommendation actually funds the remaining 13 teams through the end of the fiscal year. And it should be 13 because the other four that are the skid row um, engagement teams were funded through the, through the entire fiscal year. For um, recommendation five, the change that we're proposing is we are asking the housing department to amend the loss of contract for the, for the additional funding. But the additional change we're proposing is that we also amend the contract to include the reporting requirements as part of this outreach. So to ensure that we have the information we need to assess the success of this effort, um, including a weekly reports during the assessment process, uh, bi-weekly report during the engagement period, um, and of course, the after action report that is really critical to assess the success of these efforts. Um, again, for recommendation five, we would replace this language here with the language I read earlier from the city attorney so that LASA would um, collect this information, but again, only, only um, and provide it to the city attorney as, as needed. So, so that language is the same as the language I read earlier. And we would want to collect uh, interim and permanent housing retention rates for all placements. That's a really critical to, to determine how successful our housing uh, placements have been, right? If people remain in their, in their placements um, or if they're being placed in interim housing, are, there, are they able to move to permanent? And if they're placed in permanent housing placements, are they, do they continue to remain in that placement, you know, two months or three months after that placement or six months? Um, so that is, is critical to ensure success of these efforts. Um, and then, of course, some additional reporting requirements for everyday outreach um, to, again, understand how many people are being served and really what the placements are so that we have more visibility into that effort. Um, for recommendation six, 
we added that our office would report within 60 days on recommendations for alternative models to support voluntary compliance of 4118 because we realized it cannot wait till Feb until February. And it's important that we uh, provide some models so that LAPD is not the only um, only source of enforcement if, if need be and to really ensure voluntary compliance and not enforcement. Um, then we would like to come back in February to report on the need for additional sources for the street strategy. Um, you know, I want to point out that we're not allocating additional sources. We're asking that we use our current resources, the current resources that we are funding, uh, the 17 um, engagement teams that LASA runs currently. And uh, we also want to come back and report um, on any uh, funding or reimbursement needed for LADOT, which is the uh, department that would be uh, developing the signage and posting it to implement 4118. Um, any additional data systems that we need to report um, accomplishments and outcomes. And again, assessment of um, the engagement strategy. And finally, whether we need to issue a request for a proposal for additional outreach services. And uh, with that, I am I would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chavez, members of the committee. Um, uh, it's an opportunity for you to raise clarifying questions. We do have a motion that has been made available to you for consideration I was trying to sort through all of this. Uh, obviously, it was uh, uh, too much to do in the context of the council meeting proper. Uh, the role of the committee is to try to work through these things as carefully and as thoughtfully as possible. And so that way, uh, we can handle this in a way uh, that all of us hopefully will be on the same page. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Mr. Buscaino, followed by Ms. Rahman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Yolanda, and the rest of the CAO staff. I worked on this. Um, just a few questions, if I may. I'm, I'm reminded as it relates to signs of the song, signs, signs everywhere, those signs. Remember that one, Mr. Chair? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. How many uh, signs, Yolanda, will be needed to uh, be pr produced to establish uh, part of the, um, what's before us, the 500 foot no camping zone? So, you know, I, to be honest, at this point, um, I really could not say. It depends how many, you know, resolutions are yeah, introduced. And um, so at this point, we're really not clear how many signs will be needed. Because as you know, to designate um, a site under 4118 C1 through 4, um, a resolution has to be introduced. Okay, say there's, after several resolutions, there's, I don't know, 1,500 signs. Do we know how many signs uh, DOT is capable of, uh, of producing and installing on a daily basis? Uh, no, not at this point. In fact, I asked them to uh, figure all that out. And of course, the other part of this is they'll, they will have to work with the city attorney for the language for those signs as well. So we, we will have to come back and report to you on that. Okay, that, as far as that's, that's concerned, as far as signs is also time. So under this um, proposed process, uh, what's the anticipating length of time between when a resolution gets introduced, the city can begin enforcing anti-camping zones, and what's the ap 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 absolute quickest best case scenario? Well, I, you know, it depends. If the area is not in camp, well, first I should say if the if the city council approves the street strategy and connects it to forty one eighteen for encamped areas. You, you will have to conduct a you know, street to home effort, right? But if the area is not encamped, it's, it's a different situation. It doesn't apply to areas that are not encamped. And so if a member wants to be proactive and place signage in an area near a school or a park, 
and the area is not encamped, then of course that would be much faster. Okay, so what if their best case scenario, what's the quickest we can get when there are encampments? I'm, I mean, let's be honest, uh, what we have before us are, are four um, encampments that have lined the streets um, from Silmar down to San Pedro. So best case scenario when there is a visible encampment with individuals. Yeah, I, I would I would say the fastest, and I and I would definitely defer to the outreach uh, experts on street to home um, engagements. But uh, I would say the fastest may be thirty days because um, I think most people would agree that it takes at least thirty days to assess needs and place people. But it really depends on the encampment. I mean, I think it's hard to say. What we're saying is that. It, could take up to four months, right? But it depends on each encampment. And I think somebody said earlier, it's there, you know, a small encampment, large encampments, it's, it's, I couldn't give you as fast as time, but, uh, but again, but Yolanda, defer to the experts. Let me just weigh in for a second. I think it's fair to say um, case by case. Um, and, um, those of us who have been at this work for a while, uh, all members of the committee included in that regard, uh, pretty much uh, know that. I think the thrust of Mr. Buscano's question is in part uh, one that we all um, share, namely, uh, we need to move this forward and have no further impediments placed in the way of uh, doing what we state to be our uh, objectives. Um, I think I um, read you correctly, Mr. Buscano, do I not? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there clearly are impediments um, no. that will allow us to get folks into housing quicker and um, homeless people don't need more red tape to get into housing. Exactly. I, I can clearly testify based on our experience here in, in CD15, you know, with Lamina McCoy, Gulch, the the Wilmington Municipal Building Alley, we are able to connect people to services by saying yes to um, um, housing, interim housing, all types of housing. But today, Mr. Chair, know that in these specific sites, there are still folks who are shelter resistant, who refuse to go in. So is it after so many months and sometimes years of reaching out to these individuals in these specific areas. From what I gather, we have to start the whole process over. Um, and based on what Yolanda is saying, at least a month with the outreach, followed by then, a, um, you know, approval by LASA, and then into the And then after um, certified um, by Mr. 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 Busca, you know, even the animal is objecting to your, your question. Uh, I'm sorry to put that on you, but uh, I, I need all the help I can get to manage you today. <laughs> <laughs> I just, time is of essence, as, we got, as you know, and I know you know, leading with yeah. me on the matter. Um, but even when it is approved of and certified by LASA, then we begin the legislative process of, you know, uh, submitting a resolution. Uh, and this is why I've offered my, my motion earlier this week. Um, and in the meantime, these same folks that we've been outreaching to for many, many months, a couple of years are, are going to wait even longer to get into uh, making a, a decision, a choice, whether to, to get into an available bed um, to move on or face some consequences. Cause today, uh, just last night, I had over 100 um, beds that went unused while folks are still in, in these um, uh, in these uh, these encampments. Uh, um, Mr. Busca, you know, I would just say the following, if I may. Um, if the street engagement strategy does what it's intended to do, you should interpret this as help is on the way. Uh, and I mean help with a capital H. Why do I suggest that? It means that you will have more resources at the disposal of the 15th district. Um, uh, members of this committee and the entire council will have more uh, expertise, more 
uh, understanding more uniformity, better coordination between the city and the county than ever before. Um, and the approaches that many have taken, and no, no disrespect to anyone in these remarks that I'm going to make, uh, the approaches that we have been taking up to this point can arguably be described as one-offs, ad hoc, et cetera. This is essentially designed to put a system in place with uniformity, with more clarity, um, so that we can do the work that I know all of us wish to do. I, I, I reject the language that's often used about uh, camping and the like. Camping connotes to me recreational pursuits. This is much more serious uh, than that. People are not simply camping. They're trying to survive under um, very, very uh, stressful and in many respects, undesirable uh, circumstances. And to the extent that I know that to be the case, it seems to me that we would try to embrace uh, uh, a system uh, that moves it forward. Now that doesn't mean uh, uncritically, colloquially stated, it doesn't mean whole hog. We have to make this better, uh, but properly perceived, uh, we ought to be leaning on LASA. We ought to be expecting more from the nonprofit uh, providers. We ought to be saying to each others, uh, each other on the council, listen, we need to elevate uh, our uh, commitment to this crisis uh, it means, for example, what we did um, uh, this week uh, uh, in terms of locking in how uh, 25 by 25 makes sense in terms of informing the street engagement policy, how we cause it to be understood in the context of a right to housing. All of this has to come together with the specific objective being uh, moving people from the streets uh, to dignified housing and the path along that way. Properly read, that's what, that's what this is about. Um, and I think it deserves uh, the benefit of uh, our best thinking, our best critique, and to continue to work at it. Uh, I do not feel that we've worked at this enough. And I'm not talking about the issue of the street engagement strategy. I'm speaking to the issue of our overall efforts on the homeless crisis. And so, uh, Mr. Buscaino, yeah, let me- let you me... Good points, Mr. Chair, clearly. Yeah. Just like, clearly, we, we have done outreach after outreach after outreach. Right. And we've helped souls who are the most vulnerable get into right. a safe and secure area. But even with hundreds, if not thousands of hours of outreach, we still have unused beds, still. Yeah, but part um, of that is, part of it is, a lack of an overall perspective of that essentially makes it clear that that is a legitimate, not only legitimate, but desirable choice that um, persons who are houseless ought to exercise. And I'm simply suggesting that the work uh, that we have sought to do in the 10th district ought to be aided by this street uh, engagement strategy. Uh, we have to put more on it. Uh, and so we move that 100 beds to 50, that 50 to 25, because more voices and more force forces are at work, educating each other, lifting and engaging. So it is not born exclusively by a single council member and a single nonprofit who is strapped for resources. Yeah, it, so understood. that's kind of what I'm about. Understood, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just have to be responsive to the residents across the street from Gulch. Um, oh, I take people. that point. And they're in, saying in real time. Me today, it's like, hold on. We've said yes to solutions, and I still see 12 tents in front of my home when there's available beds. So I want to be responsive to those residents and the businesses alike um, who here, um, we have a heart of gold in San Pedro, Wilmington, Harbor City, Harbor Gateway, and Watts. And yet we owe it to those souls who need the most help but also those who said yes to help. As it relates to suitable housing, maybe a yeah. question if I can, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, what is Robin. meant by suitable housing 
option and who decides what's suitable. Um, because a testimony from our colleague, Mr. Bonin, um, some, some folks are not, suitable housing may not be um, a bridge home or suitable housing may not be a, a tiny home village, a tiny home. Uh, um, so who decides that, uh, Yolanda? Um, I will ask some of the, maybe Heidi or the outreach workers or one of the other key folks here, experts to respond. But I will say that the way we're defining suitable housing option is uh, interim or permanent housing, which includes a bridge home site, uh, congregate shelters, tiny home villages, project home key, or again, permanent housing, which could be permanent supportive or affordable, rapid rehousing, shared housing, all, sure. all, all, I would say all options of which we are funding. Sure. We are, so, right? So maybe and a question, Yolanda, if I can, a question to Heidi, uh, yeah. in those folks that we have um, through the chair, if I may, uh, yes. for those, uh, those folks who are still in these designated um, areas um, around uh, available bed, um, if, if LASA, if they say, you know what, I refuse to go into a bridge home or I refuse to go into a project room key. Uh, can LASA say, well, it's not suitable for that individual? So we allow them to continue uh, to be on the streets? No, that's certainly not the intent. Um, when we're talking about suitable, I think the concern was doing something like offering a winter shelter bed that might only be open for a month or so. So things like a bridge home, things like project home key, permanent housing, tiny homes, all of those interventions we have are, are viable options um, that could could and should be offered. And so we'll thank you for that. We'll, we'll also agree then, Heidi, for those um, say who even refuse to go into a safer location, we'll also agree to document that a person cited or arrested was offered a suitable housing option prior to citation or arrest yeah and that was what yolanda covered earlier but yes that's part of the process here is okay. making um, sure the city has what you need so um let me uh at least a, a weigh in on this because this is this is the, the critical stuff that we need to uh, <laughs> uh dig into uh uh joe take the language of uh, citing an arrest out of your vocabulary this is uh this is the committee of lobot lobotomies over here. <laughs> Understood. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> but let, let's be honest. Look at fifty six eleven has failed us because there clearly they weren't there weren't consequences. And look at our city today. Yeah. I, no, I, I as, a la this. as a last resort, I can tell you and testify as a police officer. I did not arrest one soul for being homeless, but uh, there are criminal elements in these dangerous encampments that we know of, and those who refuse to go in because. It's a lifestyle. And, and we cannot recognize. ignore that. Right. Let's recognize let me, let me what's happening, say. truthfully, what's happening truthfully on the street today. Mr. Uh, Chair, thank you. No, 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 no debate. Uh, yep. uh, the honest talk is uh, that we're seeing more uh, examples of that than um, I would like to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. And we have to have an appropriate response to that. But in our developing a response to that, uh, we need to develop uh, responses that are in fact uh, effective and not default to strategies that are far more costly and far less effective than that which we're putting on the table here. Um, I want to move to uh, quick responses from Ms. Boyce, Dr. Adams Kellum, and uh, the hand of uh, Councilwoman Rahman has been up, and we wish to hear from her. In that order, please. Hey, everybody. Libby Boyce here from Housing for Health under Department of Health Services. Um, my response to all of this is that, that permanent supportive housing is key to this conversation. There is a continuum, and we work very hard with our partners at LASA and our partners at DMH. Um, there is a continuum, which is street-based engagement, interim housing, and permanent housing. It's not linear. A lot of people only go into one or the other, and you have to have an array of things to really uh, meet the needs. And also, these encampments oftentimes are communities. They're little communities. There's a mayor. There's a mother. 
There's a watch the back of the person who's talking to himself. You know, there's 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 a community. And sometimes there's issues with separating those communities. And that's something we we, uh, you know, deal with uh, on a regular basis, our outreach teams and St. Joseph's, what they've done in Venice. Um, you know, we have um, uh, 51 multidisciplinary teams funded in the city, uh, part of which is um, uh, St. Joseph's, the work they did at Venice, including some funding from um, supervisors Kuehl, who also has an outreach team on Venice. But um, really, right now, we have 7,000 emergency housing vouchers. We just got them. They became effective, meaning we're able to access them as of July 1st. We are working very hard with LASA and with DMH to get these leased up. I just want to make one comment, and then I think Belisha, Dr. Adams, would be great to follow up here, is that you know, outreach entails building rapport, connecting to people to services, having some wins with them so that you get the trust, continuing to find them when you're trying to build that trust, establishing incentives that work for them to talk to you, um, and getting them ready because you have to, anybody, listen, anybody who rents an apartment in LA, it doesn't take 30 days, it takes longer. So we're talking about people with multiple complex issues, histories of trauma like no one can imagine. And, you know, they are, um, think about having to get IDs. They don't have an ID, so we have to get their birth certificate. And then we have to wait till we can get the ID from the DMV. We have to find housing. We have to do all this work just like anybody else who rents an apartment. I'm just going to stop there and let Dr. Kellum talk because I think she can illuminate some other points. Please do. Yes, um, thank you so much for having me. And I know we're going to talk about some other aspects of the Oceanfront Walk endeavor and as it relates to the, uh, the strategy before you. But I just want to speak directly to the question of, of suitable housing. I think we found that suitable housing um, depends on what the person will say yes to. And I think what we need to be really thinking about is our why. Why are we doing this? Why are we in an area housing people? Um, at Oceanfront Walk, what we always said was it was a housing intervention. It wasn't a clearing intervention. It wasn't a cleaning intervention. It wasn't, it wasn't even a business you know, district intervention. It was very much clear that the, that the Oceanfront Walk area and the businesses were returning, that post-COVID we were reopening, and that the businesses had a right to open but that the people there deserved housing and they deserved another chance at life. So they very much know why we're there. And we had to be very straight. The boardwalk is reopening, but our commitment is to you and your well-being. We knew the people, just like you said, um, uh, Council Member Buscano, you know, we've been out there for years, four months. We know the people, the folks that we were working with on Oceanfront Walk want to be on the west side. So what suitable meant for them was nearby, local, um, comfortable, dignified, clean, appropriate, um, with caring people that are going to be providing food and support and mental health. And that's what we provided. That's what we offered. That's what we found. I mean, we were worried. Um, if we were going to find enough motels, we're in 12 motels with staff across all of those as if they're project rookie sites. So I just want to say, I think we can get to what is suitable. I think if we remember why we're doing it. Um, you can avoid enforcement. We did not have any arrests on Oceanfront Walk over the six week period. And that is because we were unified in our commitment to serving the dear, to serving the dear citizens. And to see this as an intervention around housing and not enforcement. I hope I, hope I answered your question. All right. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for that. Councilwoman uh, Rahman, please weigh in. I had a question that I think might actually um, be directed maybe to the city attorney, because I'm still having a little bit of trouble understanding in the broader context of the ordinance and the street strategy how this is going to play out in the city going forward. Um, so if we adopted 
today the CAO's recommendations, including the, the updates from this PowerPoint. Um, will this now be the binding protocol for all resolutions brought by the council under 4118, where encampments are present? Is this going to be part of the law of the land of how 4118 is utilized in LA? Right. Uh, city attorney, question directed to you. Mr. Marcus, or uh, who do you have with you, uh, Scott? Uh, uh, Katrina's there as well, and, and she's able to answer that. All right. Going once, going twice. Sorry, trying to unmute my my video. Can you uh, repeat the question for me real quick, please? Uh, sure. Um, if we adopt the recommendations today from this from the CAO's report, um, including these updates that are from the PowerPoint, uh, will this then be the binding protocol for all resolutions that are brought by the council under the new 4118 or under the under 4118 that's going to be going into effect on what date September 7th I believe September 3rd well this would be adopted by your committee only so it would have to still go to full council and full council there could be further amending motions but if that happens if there are further amending motions it will change if not then what you adopt today no no I mean if if it is adopted by full council then does that mean that every resolution under 4118 would have to follow this protocol as laid out here? Yes. And while we're on the subject, if I could um, point this out, um, I read uh, the chair's amending motion. And in the amending motion, it states a pilot program for 15 for each council district, whereas the CAO in her report there's only funding and noted there will be 13 HET teams. So there's some discrepancy there that should be worked out. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, there's no discrepancy. The committee will uh, uh, move forward with its uh, stated wishes and the CAA's report will have to catch up to the committee's work uh, as adopted by uh, the council. Right, uh, right. Thank right. you. Uh, thank you very much. Ms. So Brown, I, please proceed. Yeah, I, I had a couple of other questions. So, uh, you know, you, uh, the recommendations that you've sent out um, for the counts, for the committee members who adopt today, Council Member Ridley Thomas, yes. um, has a recommendation to create a working group to assess, select, and triage one pilot location in each council district to implement the street engagement strategy and to report back to this committee in February 2022 on the results and lesson learned. And so if these recommendations are adopted today and then the full council adopts these recommendations, does that mean that there will be a maximum of one 4118 location per council district from now until February 2022? That could be the subject of an enforcement action? Uh, pursuant to this being piloted, the answer to that would be yes. What does that mean pursuant to this being piloted? In other words, what we're talking about with respect to the number of uh, efforts in any given council district, uh, that's effectively the pilot. We're not gonna run um, uh, this whole street engagement uh, strategy into action full bore without having uh, the benefit of uh, developing uh, best practices. That's essentially the thrust of this. So if a council district were to bring forward, let's say seven resolutions on seven different locations at this time, that would mean that only one of those would actually be adopt, be able to be adopted by the full council and then move forward under this street engagement pilot strategy. And, let me, say, and let me say why that's the case. It's very practical. It's not ideological, it's not political, it's not philosophical, it's very practical. In other words, uh, these efforts, that is to put forth a street engagement strategy, will require allocations of resources. Uh, and uh, to the extent that that is the case, um, there may be extensive needs and CD, uh, for CD 10, CD 15, 
and we haven't made the allocation of resources. So this is a prudent way of saying, let's move forward, let's pilot it with the resources fully in place and the like. It's very practical as to why it's being proceeded, uh, proposed in that manner, Ms. Rahman. Yeah, so I just, I'd love to hear from the city attorney on this as well, because we just yesterday, I think it was yesterday or day before, in the council, there were like 11 resolute or a resolution that identified 11 different sites um, under the under 4118. So I just wanted to hear from the city attorney as well about whether this was the case that only one of those sites per council district would be adopted under the, the no. law. Thank you, Councilwoman. I'm not familiar with the 11 resolutions that you're talking about, but as far as today, um, the chair is correct that we, if as proposed the amended motion, you will have a pilot program that will establish a pilot in each council district and whatever resolution you propose and pass today will be the street strategy that is put into effect or through the duration of the pilot program. So it should just be one. We shouldn't have 11 different resolutions saying different things. We should only have one. We should only have one per council. Program, so one strategy. Other, yeah, so there's no other in Okay. I'm not sure if I'm being clear to answer your question, and that's because I'm not sure I know what you're referencing as far Ms. as- Ms. Rahman, if I may, it's actually the resolution I introduced on Tuesday, which was one motion to encapsulate 11 sites. Yeah, so I'm just wondering what happens. And, you know, I just, I, I guess I just don't understand what's gonna happen with those resolutions right now, and I'm just trying to clarify. Like if there's uh, 11 sites, does that mean one site will be selected as a pilot by the working group? And that's the answer, the, the answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes, Ms. Rahman. The answer to that is yes in terms of the one pilot per district for reasons related to uh, fiscal uh, responsibility, reasons, reasons related to testing the efficacy of what we essentially implementing. And, and so, and so I, does that mean that it's only one site where the signs will go up as well? Well, the entirety of the street engagement strategy as it is defined is what uh, we can speak to. And so um, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm that sorry. this is... I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so sorry to be pushy about this. I just like, you're not being pushy. I just, I just don't, I just don't understand what's happening. So there's, there's this whole thing where you're supposed to put up signs and then two weeks later, people can't be there anymore. And then there's a street engagement strategy that's piloting something. So does that mean the signs will not go up at those 11 look or it will, will go up at one out of those 11 locations? Or does that mean signs can yes. go up at 11 and there's going to be a street engagement pilot at one? It can't go up to the 11 or any other such number until the uh, the council makes the determination that such would be the case. And that hasn't happened. It doesn't, uh, CD10 can't put up uh, any number of strategies and resolutions and they go into effect unless it goes through a process and is in fact adopted. And so uh, the only thing that can be said with certainty at this point is pursuant to this motion should it be adopted uh, by the committee process and ultimately by the council, we are piloting the street engagement strategies and people will need to get on board with that. And the business with the resolutions as they come forth will then have to be taken case by case. Those don't have any standing absent the adoption of the council. And it is not to be determined a priori that those measures will be adopted. What will be the case should the council, assuming that the committee work is done, then you'll know that we have 15 council districts where you have one pilot underway fully tied to the street engagement strategy and the issues related to the ordinance. No cart before the horse. Okay, so so just like 
so from the motion that you put forward on Tuesday, Councilmember Buscaino, can someone walk me through what happens now? Like, let's assume that goes through the Public Works Committee where it's been assigned and it gets approved there and then it goes to full council. So what happens then? So I guess well, I would say, uh, Councilwoman, I mean, nothing has been approved, right? So the, the issue is that in order for you to connect 4118 implementation to the street engagement strategy, you have to approve the recommendations in the street engagement strategy. But I miss, I'm assuming but the motion and the, and the same thing with the motion in order for, for the postings to go up at those sites, you would have to, the full council would have to approve the resolution, right? So it, nothing has really been approved. So let's say both of those move forward, which I is, I think that's a big, I think that's a big assumption, Ms. Raman. That's a big assumption. I guess I'm just trying to understand what happens if both of those go forward. I'm saying I would respectfully suggest that we cannot determine that such would be the case. Until there are eight votes that say so. I think the discussion is in part respectfully academic because there is no such determination. I guess I, I'm still unclear on what's happening, but. Um. I mean, so if I may, like the, I mean, you still need council to approve the, the pilot, right? I mean, it depends, nothing has been approved. So but it's, that's pilot. why it's hard to say. If, if council approves I, the pilot, yes, and so everybody, then everybody's on the same page that they're gonna have one pilot site to see how this works until we come back and report in February. And then if that happens, if we approve the pilot, that means that there's no 4118 enforcement actions outside of these one pilot per council district. Is that correct? Correct. If council <laughs> approves these recommendations. Yeah. Okay. That wasn't clear to me. So that's what I was asking about. All right. Mr. De Leon, are you done, Ms. Raman? No. I have some other questions, but we can we'll pro pro proceed if you wish. We can come. You know, it's 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 good. Why don't we go to Councilmember De Leon and we can go back. Mr. De Leon, thank you, Ms. Robert. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, to the CEO uh, or Deputy CEO Yolanda Chavez, um, currently the city has a UHRC. Uh, which is designed to be the point for the coordination of all the various departments and outside governmental agencies. Um, in, in your recommendation, which is almost a carbon copy of the committee's recommendation, um, it has stated here that I wrote that it's your recommendation that the CEO have a homeless coordinator as a point person um, uh, for this program. It, it, my question is, is this a replacement of the UHRC or are they supposed to work uh, in, in, in tandem with each other? So there, so it's not a replacement. And I also think the roles are different, right? I mean, the UHRC is really about immediate response and they're, and they're coordinating a city departmental response. But it's not really about a home engagement, uh, street to home engagement process. And so, would you know what the city homeless coordinator team within the CAO's office would be? Would be tracking all of those engagements and all of the reporting, so that we can report back on effectiveness. So it's definitely not a replacement, and I don't believe it's UHRC is the same. It has that same role of you know very um concentrated street street to home engagements with the coordination of all the county services and spa leads i think it's a very different effort if that explains it i, 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 I may not be sure myself yet um, but that, that's not necessarily on you per se um because my, my only concern would be is 
the CAO homeless coordinator would be a new position, if I'm correct. And well, if we're going to create a, a, another label, another layer of bureaucracy, my understanding is the UHRC in the mayor's office is sort of kind of perhaps the nerve center and the coordinator of all of the various units, the general departments, uh, agencies, uh, both internally as well as externally. And now we're going to create another position um, per your recommendation under your direction or Matt Sable's direction. And now we're creating another layer of, of bureaucracy. Um, so and I confusion. would. Okay, so I would say no, because again, yes, you're right. The UHRC, as it um, was developed by the mayor's office, and you know, as you know, departments report directly to the mayor's office, coordinate a departmental effort. The city homeless coordinator within the CEO's office is not a new position, as you know. Unfortunately, Meg Barclay took a job in Seattle and left us, but it's it's oh, not a new <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so it's not a new position. We actually have a CAO homeless team. So, for example, we currently have uh, an analyst that oversees the Prop HHH Oversight Committee and all the reporting that goes with the HHH bonds. We have some. We have another analyst who tracks the homeless budget, and an analyst that works on the roadmap and all of the homeless interventions, and an analyst that works on the homeless strategy committee and that team is part of the city homeless coordinators team we will be coming forward uh, hopefully shortly with a request for a couple of additional positions and so i want to be clear that what the cao homeless uh, outreach coordinator would do is not the direction of departments it's really about tracking the interventions and assessing the reporting that comes in so that we can come back and report to the city council on how effective this home, the street to home strategies have been. And, and uh, where was the on, just new way part, Mr. So. De Leon, um, on that point that you're making, if there's an amendment to tweak this somewhere in that question, um, just know I'm receptive to that. I mean, this is not set in stone. If we need mm -hmm. to sure. include another piece to tighten it up, that's fine. Okay. I don't know if you're Thank ready you. to do that, but I mean, I'm just saying. No, no, I, I heard you. Thank you. Uh, wow. Thank you. Um, uh, so, and then what where, I would suggest, Council Member, is when we come back and report on the options for voluntary compliance, we think UHRC may play a role there because they are coordinating with departments on the ground. And so, just so you know, this outreach coordinator that, or whatever we end up calling this person who's going to track the interventions and the reporting, it's not an on, on the ground type of person, right? So we may come back when we report back on the voluntary compliance in terms of UHRC's role because we think they could be very helpful on the voluntary compliance piece. I, I think it would have been helpful if we had um... A, a representative today um, from UHRC, um, but um, uh, the chair has already expressed um, uh, an openness, a willingness to uh, explore further uh, amendments uh, with regards to the, the various levels from the executive and from the CAOs, which is quasi pseudo theoretically serves, you know you know, two bosses, the legislative and the executive. Um, but I, I think that to me, there is a red flag there uh, in, in terms because now you also signal now that you want to come back to the legislative branch for a budget augmentation uh, for the increased responsibilities. You look a little perplexed. I, oh, no, just, no. I, well, if, I well, you, if I heard you correctly. Yes, yes. Yeah, and okay. it's not only because of this. It's because, you know, we, as you know, we're responsible for implementing over 6,000 homeless interventions hmm. and and tracking that f funding. And so it's, it's we will be coming back for additional resources. But it's not just okay. related to this. Okay. L let me go to, um, and I know there was... Um, there's a spectrum of, of thoughts and opinions in terms of the, the time frame of engagement with our um, um, neighbors, friends, loved ones um, who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I do think that um, 
two weeks is 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 a short is too short um but i think that four months is a very 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 long time um i don't know if there you know is like uh, uh, um, more thought to this how, how we got to four months uh, how, how how did we get to four months so um, because i know that everyone's different and i get that i understand that and i think that truly you know contrary we all are on the same page to you know you know the narrative or the the the, the stereotypes that the vast majority of unhoused individuals are uh, housing resistant or non-congregate uh, shelter temporary housing resistant it's been my experience i think everyone shares this that 90 percent perhaps will take it immediately and there is a small population that is housing resistant but it's a very tidy one you know so how did we land on four months because i think that four months is way too much right so well, um, so the report y yolanda uh -huh. maybe since the report appealed to industry standards and practice uh mr de Leon, I hope you wouldn't object to uh, Dr. Adams Cullen or Ms. Boyce um, rounding out some of the insights that uh, Ms. Chavez would give. Is that acceptable? Oh, no, totally 100%. Just be mindful. The only caveat yeah. is industry accepted practices when I see 41,000 people living on the street. I'm not yeah. quite sure if the industry practice has been working, you know, but that's, you know, well, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, no, Dr. no. Adams and, and Fair Ms. Enough. Boyce. Fair enough. So if I could just start, and just to be clear on what the report says, Mr. DeLeon, is this up to four months? Up to, yeah. And right, and the procedures, one of the things that we know in the procedures is that once the encampment has been assessed and the needs, that the um, outreach team together with the council office will determine the length of that engagement based on that. So it's not that they're all going to last four months. It's just that you, that's basically the ceiling, right? And yeah, it's a ceiling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Alicia, yes. Well, thank you so much. And I appreciate the diligence and thoughtfulness around the street engagement strategy. And some of this is comprised of practices that we have been um, operating in for years. And some of it is absolutely from lessons learned and mistakes made. I um, appreciate that you, we're all coming to an understanding that there must be consistency. When we approached Oceanfront Walk, in some ways we were looking to best practice. In yeah, other Dr. Ways, Adams, let, let me ask you the question. When you refer to Ocean uh, Front Walk, that was the, the, the um, um, just the latest uh, outreach action uh, on Venice uh, uh, Beach. That's what I mean. I'm sorry to, okay. to gotcha. use these okay. terms. No, 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 the the no, Venice okay. Boardwalk. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And what I'm saying is, in some ways, we were pioneering some ideas. And I think we're using lessons learned from CD10, from many other areas of, of the city, as well as Venice Beach. Um, both our successes and our missteps. And I believe that we're still uh, venturing on a path of, of, of really learning what works and what does not. And as uh, Council Member Bonin uh, said in his great leadership of this process, is that we are only in phase two. And I, I do urge you to think of these um, projects in phases. The phase one absolutely is already underway. We do engagement and outreach every single day. Um, sometimes it's extremely intentional. Some days um, we find people who are willing to say yeah, yes after months. Some days people say yes after a single engagement. Um, I, I appreciate that, that um, there's a couple of things that you've pointed out in your core components. Um, there must be coordination. I appreciate you adding that in. We would not have been able to be successful in bringing 211 people in without the leadership of CD11, the mayor, without the coordination with, with um, LAPD, LA Sanitation, at, at the highest levels of each of those organizations, uh, Parks and Rec, doing whatever was needed with the goal, as I said earlier, to house people, not to clean up the boardwalk, not to return it to one group or another, but to recognize that even for people who were saying no, to housing, it was more about the adaptation to an unhealthy life. 
to people beginning to accept a condition of living that is not meant for human habitation and helping them understand that what we were doing was not only best for everyone, it was specifically good for them. And in turn, it was good for all. So I just want to say that coordination and an understanding of why, why are we here? What is our goal? You mentioned in this, and I appreciate it, that all of this is around avoiding enforcement. As we said, almost all of our work was voluntary. Even people who said no, thank you for months and months and months. What made that happen? We were consistent. We were humane. We were you know, empathic. We gave them more time. We addressed their immediate needs. We found housing that they found suitable, not just that we found suitable. And then once they moved into the housing, we and we are now in phase two, supporting them to find permanent housing. And so there has to be a clear sense of what we're doing, why we're doing it, providing ample time for engagement. Your teams are going to know in those various areas how long they've been in the space, and they're going to know what is needed, and they're going to know the needs of the folks. We knew that in order to house people in Ocean Front Walk, we had to have the Project Room Key site um, expand, uh, extended. It All was due to up. close, yeah. and we yeah. had to have more time because we knew that they were going to need to, to be able to, so for some people, especially the vendors, to be really close to where they've been living. So I just want to say that the availability of housing, as, as Mike Bonin said, you have to start with that because we're not saying move. They know if you're just going to move into a motel, they're like, well, you're just moving us because we're a nuisance. And we're a nuisance because people haven't provided housing that's affordable. But what we, when we say we're going to find housing for you, not just a motel, then you've got people listening. Then you've got people responding in a very different way. It makes it all so much more difficult. And you are going to need resources, not just on the front end, but absolutely on the back end of this work, because we are managing 211 people across 12 sites that weren't in those sites June 1st. Mm -hmm. And that is a heavy lift to be successful in phase two. All right, Ms. No, Liddell, no, and then Ms. Robin. Uh, um, no. Uh, Libby, I don't know if you were going to add something awesome. with you. Just a couple, just a couple points. I think what is different about this pilot, and we have found in past with, um, you know, uh, encampment to home, and what some of the efforts that have been going on, is there is a focus and an intensity on a certain geographic area, which our MDTs, the LASA staff, DMH, they're spread very thin throughout you know, the county. Um, and so uh, they can't really focus on an area really intensively. They sort of have to give everybody a little bit. And in this kind of scenario, we get to actually focus and it moves faster because of that. You're still going to have people who are going to take more than four months, I hate to tell you, but you are. Um, you'll have some will take something immediately. It, it really varies and it varies on the culture of that encampment. And we really can't measure our success uh, you know, based on the past, because right now we have an unprecedented influx of permanent housing and interim housing. Um, and so, and that's one of our priority areas is these encampments, getting them into permanent housing and making that, that link for them. 7,000 is not enough, not even nearly. <laughs> I just want to make that point. We need more interim housing. We need more permanent options. And then the front end has a way easier job and it gets faster and so on. So and I me, just want to, if I can okay. add one yeah. more thing, just about the four months and just helping you see that this is a, a sincere engagement. When people feel rushed, when people feel like, oh, and we did, we, we said it was a six week engagement. Some people thought that that was not a very wise thing to say. Well, because we had been out a year. And because we had been very diligently working with people since March, April, and throughout COVID, we really believe the six weeks made sense. But understand that the six weeks of the Venice engagement was really part and parcel to a year-long engagement and effort. So please note that that four months is important. It is about relationship building, and it is about a sincere effort because the people in those spaces, in those encampments, are giving up one community for another unknown 
community or an unknown space. And we want to get them to yes, because I think that what we will measure a successful engagement is, as you said, that it's voluntary, that people say yes, and they're not arrested. And that is one important thing that we were driven by. And who does the work helps that. Um, 40% of our agency are people with lived experience of homelessness. Close to that same number, even more, are people who have experienced trauma and mental health challenges. So who is on those teams, the MDTs that Libby's team helps fund, are made up of people who are peers who more recently got off of the streets to people who are licensed practitioners who grew up living in cars with their families. Those are the folks that know how to do that work. And to some of the callers, yes, we are lived experts because yes, we have lived traumatic backgrounds, experiences of racism and homelessness and, 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 and many of our, our team members, um, really difficult backgrounds that they are bringing to bear in every day that they engage people who are unhoused. So I just wanted to bring that up as well. Sure, no, I, I appreciate it. And Dr. Adams, um, let, me, let me respond uh, to both you and Libby and then ask another question through the chair. And I know that there, there are other members who, who have uh, uh, questions. Um, so I, I agree 100% in terms of coordination with all the various uh, departments and units uh, to uh, make a successful um, um, outreach program uh, just that, successful. Um, and then the phases, the phase one, the short-term interim, uh, uh, hopefully non-congregate, you know, um, I, I call it temporary housing. Some folks will call it, you know, shelters, because I do say it, it's not lost on me. Folks may have different opinions, but when you're offered a, a motel room in comparison to living out on the streets, when you have a bed, clean sheets, clean towels, you have a shower, you have your own bathroom, you have your own HVAC system, you have a television, cable, you have a comforter, pillows, you have a locked door, relatively speaking, into what the reality is today for those experiencing homelessness, that's pretty damn good. So the the desire to want to stay longer and to turn that down to me, in my opinion, unacceptable. Nonetheless, I understand what the reality is for some folks who are experiencing homelessness who still feel that's not good enough, period, that they want the permanent component right now. And that's where lies the conundrum with governments and current systems right now is we don't have the stock, we don't have the inventory, but we can shoehorn folks directly, right? Disregard the tiny cabin shelter component. Disregard home key component. We go from point A straight to point B, but we know that's not our reality for a whole variety of reasons, because of resources, because of lack of you know, leadership and will for folks to establish those housing uh, 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 units that are solely needed across the board. But I agree. Now, l let me say this, is that if we worked with Heidi, when I was just uh, first elected, uh, we did something very similar. But we didn't do it with all the fanfare. We didn't do it with all the media circus. We did 108 individuals on Huntington Drive and El Sereno. And we had Exodus and we had a uh, 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 union station uh, come in to manage. We closed escrow uh, with the help of Heidi and the folks at LASA. It was the LASA outreach team. It was Exodus outreach team. It was my staff, CD4. So we did the same thing. The only difference was we didn't have the circus. We didn't have the media circus. That's the exact same thing without the media circus. And the end result was everyone, except for there was one individual who was still there. He was very angry, very upset, and refused to go. But I understand why he was angry. He was angry because we took away his market, because he was the drug dealer selling the crystal meth to everyone who was there. And I wasn't gonna give him a room because I was not gonna give him a room and take him directly to his market. So, and there was another woman who was severely sexually traumatized since a, 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 a young teen uh, from the local area too. And I think it was what's different in terms of Mike's 
um, dynamic on Venice is you have a lot of folks who are not really from Venice. And maybe perhaps one thing that helped us a little bit more in El Sereno is that quite a few folks were actually from that neighborhood. They're from the same high school, they're from the same middle school. They chose not to go to Skid Row. They chose not to go anywhere else. They want to be close to family members, but knowing they were experiencing homelessness. So this is something clearly, and because and this is where I think our chair, Mr. Buscaino, Ms. Rahman, I think everyone will universally agree. This is where lies the conundrum that we've been facing. Because, and I think Mr. Chair actually alluded to this earlier. Councilmember Mitchell Farrell expended money from his own budget, from CD13 budget, for that whole operation, for CD13. And in this case, with regards to the operation that you helped spearhead through the leadership of Mike Bonin, that became available because I, along with a few others in the budget committee, you know, authorized the $5 million. Without the $5 million, that doesn't come to fruition. So the point being here is, again, and it's no fault of yours, but you've done exemplary work, you and your staff, you know, is that when you don't have a coherent overall strategic plan, we're sort of ad hoc all over the place. And we're reflexive based on political, you know, environment. Who shows up and creates a media firestorm and media circus, boom, and trains start moving all of a sudden, much more quicker than they were originally. So that means that someone gonna show up in my district and Mr. Willie Thomas district and Nithias or in Joe's and elsewhere and create a media storm and quickly we're moving and allocating dollars left and right. That's not your fault at all whatsoever. It has nothing to do with you. You know, you're executing and you're doing God's work by moving the folks, you know, to provide, like you said, phase one, because we're lacking on the phase two. That's what we're lacking on phase two. And that's all hands on deck. That's Washington, D.C., our friends in Congress. That is our alum. I'm alum in the state legislature to us and the county board supervisor. So that I appreciate. The last question I have is the following. Is that the MDT teams the multidisciplinary teams. And I don't know who this goes to. I don't know if it, Mr. Chair, if this goes to Ms. Chavez or Ms. Ms. Mar, uh, uh, Heidi, uh, Ms. Marston. When, when the MDT folks come in and there is a determination among the LASA HET, and if I start messing up all the acronyms, forgive me, because I know it's HET, it's LASA, it's SPA, SPA, it is, you know, um, MDTs, uh, um, PH, it's a bunch of it, right? It's a whole alphabet suit right there. But how are we going to engage with the county if the county has a lack of beds on the mental health services? Because so on paper here, it kind of sounds good that we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And this is not no one's fault here. You know, be very clear about that. Not issuing, you know, any any uh, any 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 fault. But with the mental health department of the county, there's an acknowledgement that there's a lack of capacity. So the question is, how does that work right there? And the last question I, I throw out to you is that because City 14 has the plurality of our unhoused individuals in the city of LA. And is this going to be a situation where the one who screams the loudest and squeak, squeaky wheel gets the most attention? So if someone runs and moves forward with all these motions and all these motions or resources now shifted in other parts of the city. And the reason why I say this is because City 11, and I said Mike Bonin did a great job, you know, but City 11, according to LASA numbers, has a total of permanent supportive housing units and temporary shelter beds, 2,000. So I'm looking at CD1 has 5,000. CD9 with current price has a little under 5,000. CD14, much work that predated me, has close to 10,000. Which kind of makes you understand why you have the situation. So the systems and i know the chair has been trying to get down to the systems you know 
So when we have the system down correctly, when we execute, we know what we're executing. So the question is, the multidisciplinary teams, how is that going to work when the mental health department doesn't have the capacity? Uh, I'd One, like to address that if I okay. could. Yes, and uh, two, do we shift resources away? Is this going to be an equitable way how we're doing this? Or is this like first come, first serve? Or is this, you know, the squeaky wheel gets, you know, uh, the most attention, i.e. Venice Beach? Um, I, I just want to say the multidisciplinary teams are funded under the Department of Health Services. Um, and the Exodus team and the Union Station team that you referenced that helped your area are MDTs that are funded through the Health Service Department. Um, DMH has home teams. Those are specifically for people who are street-based, who are uh, severely mentally ill and very unstable. Um, they don't have enough, I will say that, so any advocacy on that front would be great. Um, but I want to make a point, and I, and I welcome the City Council to be more involved in the coordinated outreach system that is out there between um, LASA, between um, DMH, and we have a leadership group that gets together weekly. Um, we have a, a, a person who coordinates all outreach in service planning areas. That is the entity that is responsible for that service planning area and making sure all the outreach services. So let me, let me just ask you one question, just for information purposes. You just say that the MDT are, is, is part of the health department. Correct. Is that Gailey or Ferrer or is that someone else? I'm not sure who Gailey and Ferrer are. Department of Health oh, okay. Services is a department yes. under the County of Los Angeles. Housing yeah, who's Park in Health. charge? That, 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 who's in charge is what I'm asking over there. Who's well, that charge? would be, I mean, the MDT is me. MDT, okay, MDT is you, yeah, okay. But then the, 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 the overall that department where you're at, who's in charge over there? Uh, Housing for Health, it's Sarah Mann. Okay, okay, gotcha, okay. And the department uh, uh, CEO is Christina Galley, Dr. Christina Galley. That's what I was asking. It was, it was Christina right. Galley. I said right. Galley. I mispronounced. Okay, so sorry. It's, it's Mark's wife. Yeah. I, I just want to say that we have um, a coordinated outreach system. It has been working now for three years. Um, we always have lessons learned. Um, and certainly Encampment to Home was one of those things that really did actually impact how we operate. Um, and we work with our community-based organizations very closely. I think uh, Dr. Adams can attest to that. Uh, we know what LASA is doing. We know what DMH is doing. When we need to be together and go see an encampment, we do. When we want one to go because they have this expertise or that, we, we're able to do that. All of this is discussed daily. Um, they're in contact daily. The heads, the MDTs and DMH home teams, they all know each other. They know when to refer. They know what to do. And we are happy to have the city join our leadership team, which we've offered before. Um, sometimes people come, not always. But um, you could definitely learn more about that, and we can come and do a presentation on that. It sounds like it's really needed. Thanks very much, much the, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, Mr. DeLeon, for those questions and uh, provoking a, a lot of thought in terms of what uh, we're after. In the core principles of uh, Ms. Chavez's report, she speaks to uh, transparency and accountability. And much of what you were pushing on uh, uh, seemed to speak to that. I reiterate, if there's a need to I think about uh, uh, including or expanding the working group in some fashion, uh, um, no harm done. Chair is open to uh, considering that. Uh, Ms. Rahman, the floor is yours. Abby, I just had one additional question um, about the HET teams um, and, the, and the nature of the work of the HET team. So, um, uh, Yolanda, you mentioned that you're not asking for additional resources in this report. And so I was curious about uh, whether the pilots would be the entirety of the workload of, yeah. the, of the current head teams, or would they be able to, they are currently doing outreach work already for the districts. And so I was just curious about how this integrates with their existing workload. Yeah. You know, I would say, and I'm sure Heidi can add to this, that 
um, if we engaged all 17 teams, and I should say four of those are specifically funded for Skid Row. Uh, so if we engaged all 17 teams in this effort, I think it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to do any other street outreach. So I wanted to be very clear on that. That's why I say we're not recommending resources at this, at this time, but would come back in February to recommend additional resources and whether we should issue an RFP for outreach. Um, but I'm sure Heidi has comments on that. And, um, and mainly because I think we want to see, and I should say the reason we're not is we really want to see how this works. Right. And, and the recommendations on resources would really be impacted by how this works. Because we may come back and say, you know, what we really need to do is maybe fund more MDT teams, right? That's what that may be one of the recommendations, and and the outreach or and some additional outreach teams, but maybe more specialized outreach teams, right? But I'm sure Heidi has some comments on this issue, Yolanda. Yeah, the only thing I would add is. This would essentially take any of the generalist pet teams that we have that are doing our general outreach, as well as the location specific teams, and it would certainly be their entire workload. So the other outreach work that they're doing wouldn't be able to be managed. And I just, can Thank I you for that? To that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I just Please. one thing about the, the focus and the con concentrated uh, engagements really do take up all of the time of the outreach teams, and it should. It requires consistency. I like that you've included data and accountability. In phase one, it's about daily counts. Every single day, we start the morning with what did we do yesterday? Where are we going tomorrow? When we get to phase two, it takes another a different type of team to then make sure everyone has is entered into the CES system, coordinated entry system, making sure there's documentation. Most of the most vulnerable people coming out of deep encampments do not, they're not connected to the system. They don't have their driver's licenses. So you've got to think about that in your investment. I know you're looking at the pilots to, to really look at what's going to be needed, but I will tell you, you will need that investment and in resources in both phase one and phase two, because all the other areas will need to continue to have outreach efforts going forward that are not focused on the encampments. And I do want to take a, just a second, Mr. Chair, to clarify something that I shared about our lived expertise. I just wanted to clarify, make sure I'm being clear as I'm speaking so quickly, that 48% of St. Joseph Center staff of the 350 or 360 we have now are um, folks reporting lived experience. 25% with homeless experience, 48% with trauma and mental health background, 27% with an experience of domestic violence, 16% with substance use experience. So I just wanted to be clear and make sure you are aware of, of what I'm really speaking to when I talk about lived experience. Thank you very much. Can I say, can I say very very helpful. Helpful. Yes. Can I say uh, just through the chair very quickly? What, what 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 Dr. Adams just articulated right now completely debunks the absurdity uh, when folks are coming in and are acting like these are you know um, some stone cold bureaucrats you know who are engaging, but rather to the point that uh, Ms. Adams just articulated. I don't know if it's only specific, you know, to Saint Joseph or no, it's a not. reflection of other you know entities. You know, Libby is shaking her head. You know that that uh, some of the stuff we're hearing from the folks who call in there are just absolutely absurd of uh, these faux activists who somehow live on you know uh, uh these entitlements or you know mm. on their parents dying and oh. believe they have experienced themselves on this issue they're looking for a cause and they're exploiting you know these individuals particularly individuals of color mm. yeah so Thank you, Ms. Adams, for, you know, correcting the record uh, and Mr. Libby for validating. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, you were far more <clears throat> elegant uh, than I was inclined to be in some respects. So maybe, maybe not. I may have spoken a little more euphemistically by essentially saying I told people 
uh, that uh, if they just hung in, I'm talking about the callers, the same callers that you referred to, if they had just hung in, we would correct the record um, in terms of those with lived experience and otherwise. So again, Mr. Vice Chair, thanks for uh, landing uh, the ship in the way that you did, because I think we do have to uh, make it plain uh, that uh, asserting something doesn't mean that it's accurate. And we all have an obligation to be accountable, be transparent, be accurate. Um, I, may I uh, take the opportunity to invite um, the representative uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez's staff to read uh, a statement into the record that she wanted to do. And Mr. Buscaina, if you would, uh, I'll recognize you uh, thereafter. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilwoman Rodriguez sends her regrets for being able to bring you here today, but extends her gratitude for giving me the opportunity to share some comments on her behalf. Councilwoman Rodriguez is pleased to see the engagement framework before you today. She has been a firm believer that under a universal framework like this, it is possible departments and agencies that engage with an encampment operate in a way that could provide consistency, predictability, transparency, and engender greater trust and thus greater success for homeless individuals and the community at large. This was the impetus for the legislation she introduced last year to formalize the best practices and lessons learned from the Paxton Bradley encampment to home operation that we led in Pacoima into citywide procedures. At the time, Paxton and Bradley represented the largest encampment to home operation in the city where 100% of the encamped residents were placed into housing. 67 individuals accepted and were placed into a combination of project room key and interim shelter. There was no need for police intervention, in large part because of the groundwork done in advance. We let outreach inform the approach, providing consistent outreach with the same team, regular sanitation maintenance with client participation, and clear, no surprises coordination between our office, the service provider, sanitation, and Caltrans. It worked and continues to be successful today because nearly all of those individuals have transitioned into permanent housing with the few that remain in interim being matched to a resource and working towards finding that specific unit that fits their needs. The best practices from Paxton and Bradley have been incorporated into the framework before you. Councilwoman Rodriguez thanks the CAO for their work in combining the Paxton and Bradley recommendations with the best practices of other similar operations throughout the city. Councilwoman Rodriguez would like to stress that a decentralized effort that looks 15 different ways is not going to streamline the work to keep pace with the need and is only going to leave us open to more lawsuits. She believes the street engagement framework is a critical piece to the puzzle and is supportive of its adoption today. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, give our uh, thanks and again, our condolences to uh, the councilwoman um, that will be a part of the record. Uh, the committee itself did deliberate over more than one uh, uh, committee hearing uh, pertaining to uh, practice Paxton and Bradley um, uh, for the purposes of trying to understand what was working in various council districts across uh, the city. Uh, and to the extent that that is the case, we certainly see that as one worthy uh, example what street engagement uh, looks like. And uh, this is not cookie cutter, but it is uniformity. Uh, it is about transparency, transparency and accountability. All right, Mr. Bustaino, you uh, have your hand up and then yes. uh, members of the committee, we're going to dispose of the matter and be done hopefully by 1230 if, it, if you say the same. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quickly, uh, on, I don't know if CLA is on the call. Um, I believe I saw John Wickham earlier. Mr. Wickham, are you here? Uh, yes, sir, I am here. All Thank right. you, John. Thank you so much. Just a quick question for you. Um, when do you anticipate um, your, the CLA reports um, in response to the council file uh, ending in 0329 and 0031 be ready? We are attempting to finish this report um, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. We're endeavoring to complete this report in the next, uh, few weeks, couple of weeks. There are a lot of details that we are trying to address. Um, and the information from the CAO that 
is provided today, uh, we'll, we'll need to take a look at that and incorporate that into our findings. Mr. Chair, would you entertain um, a continuance until we get these reports back from CLA? Uh, Mr. Uh, Buscaino, uh, take note of the motion where it in fact includes uh, the work of the CLA and the chair uh, would be inclined to move the item forward today with the full understanding that the work of the CLA should be incorporated in, in terms of the forward motion. Um, I take the sense of your uh, comments in terms of moving with a degree of urgency and we know how the bureaucracy can work. Um, and so I would not be inclined to continue the item today. I would appeal to all of the committee members to uh, support uh, the motion that it constitutes an amended way of uh, adopting the CL's report that has come to us with full recognition that we direct the CLA in coordination with the CL to ensure that the pending CLA report back to the said council for files um, and all of that language that really does capture um, the thrust of what you're asking Mr. Wickham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with that, I can't support the strategy as presented. Uh, just know, sir, that my, my staff and I have been working tirelessly for years, as I indicated earlier, to get our unhoused residents indoors. We built three bridge home shelters, opened two room key motels. We recently opened a tiny home village, have a, a the uh, navigation center uh, up and running. Uh, of course, our, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our uh, safe parking locations last night, 130 beds went unused. Everyone at all of our major encampments have been offered shelter. We've had countless hours of outreach, of outreach, of outreach in, in our um, entire district. This process, I feel, will make sense if we had a citywide ordinance for uh, or for encampments that have been visited before, but it's not. We'd have to start the whole process over, knowing that we have the relationships, as indicated by our professional uh, team that's here. We have the relationships. We reached out on numerous occasions, but this process described here is too bureaucratic and it will take way too long to address the urgent public safety hazards. In fact, Mr. Chair, you may recall three years ago, the Sheriff's Department forcibly evicted an encampment north of Lamita Boulevard in an area known as the Pit. Uh, they were pushed across city limits into my district and the stated rationale was that there was a buried jet fuel pipeline. I didn't like it but I understood the rationale. Our primary responsibility in local government is ensuring public safety. But under this policy, after there was an encampment fire under a bridge in my district that burned so hot it actually melted a pipe carrying natural gas, I wouldn't be able to remove it for months. Um, there are some locations where it's simply unsafe to allow encampments and we must have the ability to restrict them immediately. There's also a facility in my district that manufactures a highly flammable hydrogen gas and there have been numerous encampment fires less than a block away. So I understand the desire to be compassionate. We've done that here. We've proven that with solutions, we can clear our and keep our um, safe, our, our public spaces passable and safe, but we can't be reckless. We pass an ordinance that says enforcement can occur 14 days after signs get posted. That's what our residents and businesses expect. And that's what I expect. So for those reasons, I can't support this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Uh, Buscaino, I uh, want to say the following in response to your uh, remarks. Uh, without apology, I respectfully disagree, uh, but not because I don't acknowledge the fact that you've worked mightily uh, to address the crisis uh, in the 15th district and have sought to be prescriptive as it relates to what could happen citywide. Uh, we take note of that, but I assure you, sir, uh, there is nothing about what we are considering today uh, that would impede the process, impede the process of making conditions better in the 15th district or any other district. I see this as value add. And I'm smart enough to know, Mr. Busca, you know, that your own brand of ingenuity will allow you to take the best of what's in this street engagement strategy and improve the quality of life of the housed and the unhoused in the 15th district. Uh, do not see this as impediment. See this 
as a tool to help you accomplish that which you know is important to accomplish uh, in the district uh, that you represent. That's certainly the way I'm going to interpret it. Uh, uh, I believe that other members of the uh, council uh, who are sought to move this agenda forward understand it uh, similarly. Uh, we have an opportunity here and we should seize it. Uh, we have advanced something that has never been considered before uh, members of the uh, committee. And the total issue is not to bureaucratize the process. It is essentially to make it more effective with outcomes. Might I submit for your consideration that the status quo is woefully inadequate and unacceptable. And it is because of the conspicuous absence of the very strategies that we are trying to bring to scale here. Uh, Mr. Buscaino, I respectfully request that you give this a chance. Uh, appeal to your better angels. Uh, it is not law enforcement that can ultimately address this. They obviously play a role. My point of view is back in. Uh, some might want to bring it uh, too uh, close to the forefront. Uh, I think what we know is that the training, the discipline, the tools and the like don't effectively help us do that. We're not going to reincarcerate. There is no propensity here uh, to cause people to go to jail. No, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to move people from the conditions of the streets with are unacceptable to a place of dignity and purpose that honors the worth of their lives. Uh, I believe this is what can happen. Uh, this is about uh, confronting this crisis with care, with compassion, and with a commitment to compliance. No two ways about it. Yes. Uh, if you if you would permit, uh, the hour uh, strikes. Uh, no, it's a point of personal privilege since you, you're addressing me here, Mr. Chair. Well, let me I'm, be clear. I'm clearly going to acknowledge let you. Clear. To you speak. Let's, let's steer clear of the false narrative that we're arresting people for being homeless. We have oh, not no. arrested a soul in my district for being homeless. You've actually helped people get into a safe no, place Mr. with a roof over their Mr. head. Mr. Mr. Busca, and, and let me remind you, as a city, city, respect the chair for a moment. I didn't say that you as I have. I've paid you as many compliments. <laughs> Uh, I understand. As a, a progressive is inclined to play a conservative. <laughs> no, we just be careful with that false narrative about using no, law no, no. enforcement. No, no, no. We know, only. you and I both know <laughs> that there is a propensity uh, to put the law enforcement piece up front. I am not suggesting that that is your default. I'm, let's just clarify. Right. I'm not saying that you tried to arrest your way out of this. But Joe, look, I, I've right. seen you and I have acknowledged the work that you have done in trying to lean in. I'm saying to you, your work can be enhanced uh, if you were to give this the chance that it's due. That's all I'm saying. Understood. I, I know the amendment, one of your amendments you'll propose is, is to look at pilot program and, and reporting back, sir, uh, right. from February 2022. Right. Uh, I don't have I don't have time. I don't have time for that. We, this is where, you know, uh, we're with these now we're looking at forming a group uh, of a, a group, a working group uh, to to get report backs. And meanwhile, our residents and businesses and those most. But this is not going to keep me from doing what street. I need to do. This is not going to keep uh, 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 Ramen or De Leon from doing what they need to do. So it shouldn't keep you from doing what you need to do. Use it to help you do more of what you can do better. Uh, with that, uh, Shall we be able to move on? I think someone did call for the previous question. Uh, he shall remain unnamed at this moment <laughs> since he still wants to talk. Uh, Ms. Rahman, uh, are you ready to proceed? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. De Leon, are you ready to proceed? Mr. Chair, let, let me, uh, yeah. let me, uh, I know there's a, a spectrum of, of, of thoughts you, and opinions. You in, can in a speak if days. you admonish Mr. Uh, Buscaino, it'd be fine. <laughs> bad Joe, bad Joe. Yes, it does. Compassionate Joe. Compassion, passion, compassion, Joe. Um, I, I know there's a spectrum of, of, of perspectives across the board. And I think there was a lot of stuff that, that was, was brought uh, 
thrown at us. And I think there's been a lot of hard work and not only uh, through you, Mr. Chair, through your staff and, and working with the CAO's office and, um, and other uh, agencies to bring this together. The, the, the one piece is we, we highlighted a couple of, well, I did, you know, a couple of red flags. I think the one piece that's missing here is the, the question of the, the CLA and they haven't, I'm not quite sure why Mr. Wickham, you know, if I can ask a question, you know, to the chair of, of Mr. Wickham. Okay. Mr. Wickham, you know, not to, you know, critique or admonish yeah. you or, you know, is everyone sort of kind of came prepared, you know, today was the reason why you guys weren't prepared, you know, or, or you weren't able to make your presentation uh, today. Sorry, I'm having muting issues. Um, yeah, we were not, our report has not been finalized yet. We're, um, we're working to complete the details on that. And, and how long do you need the details? Because obviously there's, there's a sense of immediacy, urgency, um, the 4118 plan uh, to the chair's credit. You don't want to put something out there and everything's going left and right, but sort of kind of systematically make it as efficient and less bureaucratic as possible. Um, the net added value that you bring, what's a perspective? There's some things that you can share with us in, that are insightful, like a, uh, uh, because, you know, if, if, if it's sort of kind of something that's a dramatic departure or some fundamental amendments that you think are necessary to make this as strong as possible. Um, uh, it's something that I think we need to know, all of us need to know. Um, we, we are not in a position to uh, contradict the work that the CAO has done. There may be some um, refinements that we would want to take a look. I just haven't, I just saw the presentation that was made today. So I don't know what the impacts of that are on what we've said, but I don't see that there would be any um, conflict uh, I, we just want to make sure that we cover, as you're saying, the comprehensive approach, because there are components of outreach that are outside of the street strategy. We want to make sure that we cover the bases um, accurately and, and uh, effectively. And when would your report be ready, you know, for presentation to this committee? You may have said it earlier. I may, I may have just stepped out our... Um, uh, I just may not have been paying attention, which... No, no, yeah. Mr. De Leon, okay. uh, Two weeks. The, the direction is in uh, point number two uh, of the, the amending language that causes the CLA to get on board with what exactly it is you're saying. Number two? Yeah, direct the CLA in coordination with the CL to ensure that the pending CLA report, all of that. So this moves forward uh, by September 3. And so the two week period that Mr. Wickham just made reference to is ensconced in this report. If I may to help Mr. DeLeon, I was asking, let's hold on this until the CLA reports to us. I know we've had countless uh, committee hearings on the governance structure of LASA. I just don't know why we, we can't wait till the CLA uh, hold us until the ceiling. Uh, uh, Mr. Buscaino. The strike number two. Uh, Mr. Buscaino, uh, we can't go fast when you want to go fast and go slow when you want to go slow. We're trying to move this all forward. A moment ago, you said it's too much bureaucracy. Now you're trying to uh, invoke the bureaucracy in a way that says, let's have another report. Now, Mr. Buscaino, Chair, I never supported oh, this from the get go, just saying. Yeah, so I, I understand. Know I know what's to come. You know, I know what's to come. We, uh, we, we, we're trying to uh, keep it uh, moving, Mr. Buscaino, and I, I would trust that you would respect that. Mr. De Leon, are you yeah, yeah. good for now? Let me, yeah, let me ask, just ask uh, one more time of the, Please. Um, okay. uh, Mr. Wickham. Mr. Wickham, so you, you say two weeks. You can't have this done by next week, you know, or um, um, because I think it would be, you know, I mean, it would be okay to delay this or continue this. Uh, that's terminology next week but you're saying two weeks and that's kind of a it's kind of a long time what is it this war and peace that what are you putting together here with this this study here uh, sir just based mr. on mr the, mr. Uh, mr. Uh, mr. Uh, mr hold on mr wickham this is referred to 
energy and environment um, and the chair of that committee. Um, that is true. That is yeah. true. Yeah. So it's we'll, a dual we'll, referral bill. Yeah. Right. So we'll push them. We'll push them forward. You know what? Um, let me ask you the, the question, Mr. Chair. Yeah. If we move the, if we move forward as is, right, right. Then to your point, which actually is a good point, it goes back to, um, and that goes back, it goes to uh, Energy Committee uh, right. chaired by uh, Ms. O'Farrell. Um, when the CLA reports, gives his uh, report, um, uh, we can bring it back uh, yes. to uh, your committee? No, it's going to keep moving to the, uh, the council at that point. But the, from, like, from the, that the committee record. to the council. So, okay. So my question yeah. is like, if they came back and they had some good solid suggestions and we wanted to add those suggestions, when would the appropriate vehicle be or the time frame? We can add that. That's what I'm saying. We can reconcile those things uh, on the council floor and that would often move through the CLA and the CL. So we're fine. And the fact of the matter is it's a matter of public record that both uh, you and I are on energy and um, That's right, the environment. Community. So, yeah. I mean, we'll-, we'll oh, you're the vice chair. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll touch it again. Uh, and if there are discordant issues, they'll all be public and we'll reconcile them uh, by the time it gets to the council. Um, uh, um, Ms. Ron, Ms. Ron, and then the last thing, I'm the last, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, may I ask one thing, just one Please. last thing? The, the question is, the, the the point number two I have in my notes is that whatever the CLA comes up with has to mirror um, the CAO, um, and, and that that's something that's quite unique because it has to be carbon copy of the CAO, or the CAO has to be carbon copy of the CLA, and if, if they are not a carbon copy of each other, something has to give. So what's the process now? If something has to give. Is the CAO's report the default, if you will? So John Wickham doesn't draft a report that is a verbatim carbon copy of the CAO. Does that mean it, 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 his recommendations, whatever they may be, because I have no idea what they are, um, uh, would not be adopted? No, because it doesn't the language that. is they have to mirror. It's not uncommon for motions to often proceed uh, with the instructions that both the CAO and the CLA uh, work to bring something back to the council. Um, in this instance, uh, they're moving on different tracks because one motion preceded uh, the other motion. What we're trying to do here and now, Mr. De Leon, is to reconcile that in Directive 2, which essentially uh, causes the CLA and the CAO to work for toward alignment in their street engagement strategy. Um, and I think we will see that uh, as we move it to uh, from here, if the, if the will of the body is to do so. And by the time it moves through the process in uh, energy and environment, and ultimately, if there is a divergence between the CLA and the CL, which I don't necessarily anticipate, but we'll have to wait to see that, it can then be reconciled on the floor of the council. Okay. I mean, you right. know, I would stress with you, Mr. Wickham, to, to, to please um, um, accelerate your process as quickly as you can possible, because it would be good if you can, uh, with the Energy Committee, um, I think sometime next week, ideally, right. it, it, you know, you would have your report back and then we can reconcile anything in the energy committee um, as we right. move forward, even before we get to the floor itself. Um, yeah, so I don't, Mr. Wickham, can, let me ask, Mr. Wickham, can, can you commit to that? I I don't know that I can commit to that right now, but we will. I understand your in, your request and your instruction, and we will we will work to get it done. Well, let I, me, let, I just think let it's let more me, elegant that way. Yeah, it does. And, and Mr. Wickham, let me uh, just weigh in um, by indicating that both the chair and the uh, vice chair of the committee uh, make that request of you. You should read uh, uh, Directive uh, 2 uh, as an expression of that very sentiment. Ms. Rahman. Uh, not much to add. 
to add to this discussion except to say that, you know, I think we've already heard from Mr. Wickham that his, uh, that what we're discussing today is not going to conflict with the framework uh, and the analysis in his report. And um, I'm, I'm as eager as all of you to see his work move forward and, and feel that sense of urgency, but I think we can move this forward now. All right, I interpret that as a motion uh, on behalf of uh, Ms. Rahman uh, to move the uh, motion that's before us on the citywide engagement forward. The instructions are clear to adopt uh, the recommendation of the CL report, the amending language that is uh, built into the motion that each member has um, is before us. And with that, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, um, I'd ask that you call the roll. Yes, Mr. Chair. Council Member Riley Thomas. Aye. Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Buscaino. No. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Raman. Yes. Yes. We have three votes in the affirmative, and the matter is approved as amended. Uh, we move it forthwith, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, uh, forthwith to the next committee and ultimately to the council. Uh, are there any other questions or comments to come before? Is the desk cleared, Madam Clerk? The desk is clear, Mr. Chair. Uh, may I say thank you to uh, all members of the committee. Uh, may I thank you to say thank you to uh, Ms. Chavez, uh, Ms. Boyce, Ms. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, Adams Callum, uh, and to all the staff who helped us up to this point. Ms. Marston, thank you for your uh, presence and participation. Uh, if uh, there's anyone who I didn't call by name, uh, charge it to my head, not to my heart. That, uh, may I say to you, have a good afternoon. We're Thank adjourned. You.